Imagine this. Your peaceful days working as an apothecary comes to an end when you're kidnapped by some men. Sold to the emperor, you spend your days as a lowly servant doing menial chores to care for his concubines. Until one day, the palace manager discovers your apothecary talents. Now, you must serve one of the emperor's royal consorts, the mother of his child, as her personal taste tester for poisons, and uncover the truth about mysterious occurrences within the palace or face execution by the emperor. This is the story of The Apothecary Diaries. So let's get started and watch the story unfold. A young apothecary girl picking flowers and herbs is sent by her father to deliver some medicine to the Verdigris house. He warns her to be careful on her way there as kidnappings of women are on the rise. The girl, Mau Mau, claims she'll be fine. She just wants to stop by an herb plot on her way back. She runs through the busy red light district, making her way into the Verdigris house, a well-established brothel. Pyrin, one of the most famous courtesans of the brothel, enters, concerned about Mau Mau's wounds on her arm. Mau Mau thinks nothing of it. It's just one of her usual drug experiments. The owner of the house, the madam, then enters, scolding Mau Mau, telling her she better not be setting off explosions again from her so-called experiments. But. When the madam offers Mau Mau courtesan lessons, Mau Mau storms out, leaving the meds she was sent to deliver behind for the madam. Outside the district, in a field, the sight of herbs makes Mau Mau light up like a cat, and she picks away with cheer. But it seems the cheer is over, with three men here to kidnap her. Now, being escorted through a basket, she knows her father will be worried. Three months pass, with Mau Mau working, having been sold as a servant to the emperor's rear palace, a place with a garden of women who are to give birth to the emperor's children. No men are allowed, only the emperor, his kin, and eunuchs which are men that have been castrated. Overall, the place is a huge collective of 2,000 concubines and servants and 1,000 eunuchs, and unlike the concubines, servant girls like Mau Mau are expendable and can lose their lives at any moment. Well, at least she gets paid. Xiao Lan, one of Mau Mau's friends, comes here teary-eyed, asking which room this plate is for. When Mau Mau directs her, we learn most of the servant girls are illiterate, just taught the bare minimum essentials of etiquette. However, Mau Mau has no intention of sharing that she can read or write, as all her hard-earned work would just be paid to her kidnappers. Now, she could be given even better treatment as a concubine, but the requirements are good looks. Unfortunately, her freckles, flat chest, and skin and bones look makes her unqualified for the job. She would rather not stand out, as her life would be at risk. All she has to do is work hard, and in two years, she'll be allowed to leave. While doing laundry, Xiao Lan whispers rumors of a hot eunuch, one who's very popular with all the women. Later, in the dining hall, Xiao Lan discusses the rumors of the curse here in the rear palace, a curse that kills all the emperor's heirs born here. So far, all three of the Emperor's children born here have grown weak and passed away. A doctor went to visit both precious consorts, Lady Gyokuyo and Lady Lihua. With no heirs previously, Lady Lihua giving birth to the prince could give her the title of Empress Consort, and thus should have priority here in the rear palace. But there is a rumor that the Emperor actually favors Lady Gyokuyo. Apparently, both mothers and childs are sick with head, stomach aches, and nausea. Hearing this gets Mau Mau's apothecary brain kicking. While working later, she considers the possibility of poison, illness, and even hereditary issues, and gets curious enough to want to take a quick peek at their conditions. Entering the area where all the high-ranked concubines reside, she notices every building pavilion to be exquisite, even down to the individual pillars. She suddenly hears the sound of a smack, watching the public spectacle of Lady Li Hua, who had just finished smacking Lady Gyokuyo onto the ground, blaming Gyokuyo for cursing her son because Gyokuyo bore a daughter. Gyokuyo responds the idea to be absurd as her daughter Ling Li is sick as well. As a two bicker, Mao Mao thinks the flustered eunuch in the middle to be a quack of a physician. How hasn't he noticed the cause of their ailments when she herself has figured it out with just a single look? Putting all the pieces of information together, especially now seeing how worn out Lady Li Hua is, this certainly is no curse. As she wanders out of the crowd pondering how to tell the two precious consorts, she utters the words, if only I could find something to write with. With the manager of the rear palace, Jin Shi, taken aback hearing those words, 
Though turning to see who said them, he finds no one. In her quarters, Lady Lihua finds an important message in a flower, but ends up tossing it aside. A dark night of terror comes as Lady Li Hua cries at the death of her son, the young prince. A little under a month later, as everyone continued their work in the palace, they wore black sashes to mourn the passing of the prince heir. In Lady Gyokuyo's quarters, Jin Shi hears from her that when she visited the crystal pavilion to have her daughter examined, she had found a note on the windowsill tied to a branch with the words, the white face powder is poison. Don't let the baby touch it. Both Gyokuyo and Jinshi knew it wasn't from the palace physician. After all, he couldn't figure out how to treat the prince. And thus, Jinshi is now tasked with finding who wrote the note. He smirks, remembering a young servant girl who was literate had passed by him in the crystal pavilion. On another day, the young servant girls are summoned by the high officials. And when Jinshi enters, all the girls blush and gawk at him. Except for Mao Mao, who wonders who this arrogant looking woman is. He presents himself as the rear palace manager, and Mao Mao is surprised that a man so handsome as him is a eunuch, because now he can't have any children. Jin Shi then holds up a sign that reads, You, with the freckles, stay here. Mao Mao reads it slowly, and oh no, everyone begins to notice her. Jin Shi then tells everyone to return to their rooms as he's done with them for the day. Oh man. She's the only servant here who can read. He wrote that just now to single her out. She tries to escape, but Jinshi has no intention of letting her leave. As they walk together, he remarks it was odd after looking her up, because her description said that she couldn't read. Mao Mao tries to play it off with a meek tone, saying, I'm of lowly birth. It must be a mistake. Determined to never admit it, as pretending to be ignorant makes everything in this world easier. She gets annoyed, wondering how Jin Shi found out about the messages. The two make it to Lady Gyokuyo's room, and with the awing of happy little baby Ling Li, Mao Mao feels relieved. Gyokuyo thanks Mao Mao as her baby's savior, but Mao Mao denies these actions as she doesn't want to get involved. However, Jin Shi pulls out the note received by Gyokuyo. It's written on a fabric used in the clothing for serving girls. Did Mao Mao perhaps rip apart her skirt? making Mao Mao jump back, covering her backside, knowing she's been caught. Jin Shi then has her explain why she put the flower on the windowsill that day. In a more serious tone, Mao Mao describes that she figured out the makeup powder both Gyokuyo and Li Hua had been using was poisoned. Many courtesans used high-end powder in the brothels she grew up in, which had poisoned many of them, causing so many to lose their lives, trading life for beauty, but losing both. A grim sight. Having worked as an apothecary, she tells the two she knows a few things about poisons. Gyokuyo shows the white powder. It was used by the baby's nurse, who described the whitening to be better compared to other powders. Gyokuyo blamed herself, as she should have paid more attention to the things going on to her baby. Jin Shi took blame as well, thinking if he had noticed sooner, more lives could have been saved, including Lady Li Hua's baby. Gyokuyo tried to tell Li Hua about the message, but sadly, Li Hua wouldn't believe her. Given all that, Mao Mao wonders what her purpose here is. Well, starting today, she is now Gyokuyo's lady in waiting. Huh? As she leaves, she thinks, no, no, no. She can't keep a low profile now. As some Imperial soldiers rest for the evening, two fall over. Have they been poisoned? Jin Shi reads a report learning food was cooked by the villagers to serve to the soldiers, and suspected with the crime of aiding barbarians to harm the Emperor's legion, the village leader was placed into custody. Gao Shun, Jin Shi's attendant, changes the subject, asking about concubine Gyokuyo's new lady-in-waiting, Mao Mao. Jin Shi explains his reasoning to be Gyokuyo only has four women serving her, too few compared to concubine Li Hua, with the same rank having ten women serving her. This is not necessarily due to Li Hua being given special favor, but really because Gyokuyo is wise and cautious, and would never hire someone of unknown origin. That is the best way to survive as one of the Emperor's concubines. Jin Shi found Mao Mao to be the perfect choice as a new lady-in-waiting. Her knowledge of medicine is too valuable to pass up. Gao Shun has some concern that she could abuse that knowledge. However, Jin Shi plans on seducing her a little, to keep her wrapped around his fingers. As Mao Mao grabs her stuff to move out, she and Xiao Lan spot Jin Shi playing with some of the concubines. He comes over to Mao Mao, prompting her to ask if he needs anything. 
Upon hearing he doesn't, she wonders why he's here. Does he just have nothing better to do? He then caresses her hair with his hand, softly telling her to serve Lady Gyokuyo well. But this has the opposite effect on her, creeping Mao Mao out and making her feel disgusted. She then arrives at the Jade Pavilion and is greeted by Gyokuyo's head lady-in-waiting, Hong Yen. They meet with Lady Gyokuyo and Ling Li, who are both joyous to see Mao Mao. Hong Yen then shows Mao Mao around the various stations she'll be working at, until they reach the living room where they meet the three other ladies-in-waiting, Ying Hua, Gui Yan, and Ai Lan. But the three girls are taken aback seeing Mao Mao's bandages. Mao Mao tries to start helping out, but the three girls tell her to go rest up and take it easy, getting teary-eyed, explaining that Mao Mao has a special task coming up. After Mao Mao leaves, the girls worry Mao Mao must have gotten abused back at home, and now being given a terrible job, they feel so bad for her. But you'll feel good when you like this video and subscribe to my channel, because here at my Shoujo Weekly, you'll get fun stories like this one on a weekly basis. See, it's in the channel name. I'll be sharing stories in romance, action, and drama, all in the shoujo genre. So come on, hit that subscribe and give me a like. Anyways, the terrible job is being Gyokuyo's official taste tester for poison, which gets Mao Mao excited like a cat again. I, I don't think you're supposed to be happy about that. Jinshi explains the food made for concubines changes hands a few times before being brought here, leaving possible time to be poisoned before arrival. In fact, when Gyokuyo was pregnant, her food had been poisoned at least twice. The taster back then received nerve damage and still can't move her hands or feet which is why the current ladies-in-waiting are sympathetic towards Mao Mao. She then begins the food tasting, detecting no poison. Back when she lived in the brothels, she ran a lot of experiments on her arm, gradually training her body's immunity towards poisons. Many of them don't even affect her, but she's pleased to be able to get some good food, making Jinxi nervous hearing her laugh. Later, Hong Yen praises her skill, Mentioning to Mao Mao if she had said she was literate from the get-go, she could have been getting paid more this entire time. However, Mao Mao explains that her kidnappers would receive part of the increased pay, and she wouldn't like that. Hearing this, Hong Yan goes to hand Mao Mao an expensive vase, and makes it drop. It's so expensive, Mao Mao could not possibly afford it with her lady-in-waiting salary, and feigns her scheme, saying they'd probably have to charge her kidnappers for the damages, to which Mao Mao catches on very quickly. Hong Yan then hands Mao Mao her hazard pay for the food tasting services, payment almost equal to a regular stipend that only goes to Mao Mao. The next day, Mao Mao learns quickly that she'll get shoved out for any work other than Gyokuyo's meals. This consequently leaves her bored out of her mind. On a particular day though, Jin Shi needs her assistance, but with her usual look towards him, he wonders why his charms don't seem to work on her. He hands her the test materials, some bao zut buns, and upon smelling, she announces there is an aphrodisiac within them, surprising Jin Shi that she can smell even without tasting. Jin Shi already knew that, however, making Mao Mao disgusted in disbelief that he'd try to have her eat one, getting Lady Gil Kuyo to crack out laughing in tears over the ridiculous exchange. Jin Shi then starts to discuss the real reason he brought her here. He discusses the squad of soldiers on a mission to attack some barbarians that were poisoned the other day. They'd fallen ill after a meal, reporting nausea, difficulty breathing, and other ailments. The meal had been prepared in a nearby village, and the soldiers arrested the village leader on conspiracy charges. Luckily, an officer defused the situation and has put the village head's sentence on hold until they get to the bottom of how the poisoning occurred. Mao Mao ponders this until it comes to her. She learns from Jin Shi the meal was eaten at a camp outside, and that the soldiers used their own plates and utensils. With that evidence, she pulls a rhododendron flower out from the vase behind her, tasting it while telling them it actually causes nausea and difficulty breathing. The plant has poisons in the leaves, but some have poisons in the branches or roots. Some wood can even emit poison when burned. And with that, Jin Shi has learned it was most likely the wood the soldiers were burning, case closed. However, he isn't done with Mao Mao yet. He wants her to make an aphrodisiac, which gets her excited at the idea of doing her apothecary work again. She eventually composes herself and agrees to work. But in Jin Shi's office, he discusses with Gao Shun about how one of the reasons he's been employed here is to test the loyalty of all the servants and concubines against their temptation, as a concubine must especially be loyal to the emperor and chaste. However, with Mao Mao's glare of disgust, Jin Shi feels super elated? What is wrong with this guy? 
The next day, Mamao gets excited to begin her apothecary work, meeting with the quack doctor and Gao Shun. She then lights up when presented with the supply room. She begins to work, but gets annoyed with Jin Shi on her back. With the main ingredients of milk, butter, sugar, honey, and powdered cacao, she preps some chocolate to cool and harden, but also some extra for herself later that she stores on a shelf. While waiting outside for the chocolates to cool, she gets distracted by herbs outside, getting carried away till the evening, returning to find her three associate ladies in waiting immersed after eating the aphrodisiacs. Well, at least we know they work. However, Hong Yan gives Mao Mao a scolding smack. Later that night, Mao Mao presents the aphrodisiacs, with everyone in shock learning she's going to keep the bigger ones for herself as midnight snacks. Jin Shi makes a joke about eating one to test, making Mao Mao think he'd captivate anyone with his blushed face that's so pretty. After the display, Jin Shi caresses Mao Mao's hair from behind, telling her she did a good job, thanking her before taking off. In the night, a young servant girl spots a white, ghostly woman. When the woman approaches, the girl cowers in terror upon the sight of the creepy being. On another day, in the Jade Pavilion kitchen area, as Mao Mao prepares cold medicine, Ying Hua tells her about the rumor of a spirit haunting the rear palace. And later, Xiao Lan confirms the famous ghostly lady in white to her, a ghostly lady who dances in the air under the moonlight, often appearing on the eastern castle walls. Mao Mao ponders this, knowing the only way to enter is through one of four gates, located in north, south, east, and west. And even then, it'd be difficult to break in with the gates always guarded and the wall surrounded by a moat. They say, however, that sunken in the moats are the corpses of concubines who tried to escape. Mao Mao thinks nothing of this superstition, but Xiao Lan is certainly freaked out. In the physician's building, as the court physician Guan is about to serve treats to Mao Mao, Jin Shi appears, making Guan pull away to grab more. Jin Shi comes to praise her work, making her think once again that he probably has nothing better to do. She wonders how he has the authority to wander around like he's palace security. Oh, she then surmises he must be the emperor's personal favorite. Making him catch on immediately, she's thinking something inappropriate. He asks Mao Mao if she's heard about the spirit haunting, and then how it might relate to sleepwalking, which catches Mao Mao's attention. Upon asking for a cure for it, Mao Mao answers, there's no medicine that cures somnambulism. However, Jin Shi is persistent that she look into it. At night, Gao Shun guides Mao Mao to the eastern wall, where concubine Fu Yu dances under the moonlight. She is a mid-ranking concubine, scheduled to be bestowed to a military officer as a reward. Later, Guan explains Fu Yu had stumbled two years ago when showing her dancing skills to the emperor, and thus, he hasn't laid a finger on her, and she shut herself in ever since. Mao Mao thinks the shame and failure might be the cause of Fu Yu's sleepwalking, but holds out to gather more evidence. As Mao Mao turns to leave, Guan mentions Fu Yu is a princess from a small vassal state, and hopes she gets better because he's sure she doesn't want to go back, which is exactly where she's being sent. She and Gao Shun spy on Lady Fu Yu, and compare her to the Cotton Rose, a large white flower in the morning that turns a deep pink in the evening. Mao Mao learns from Xiao Lan that during Fu Yu's sleepwalks, she used to appear in the north, but now has shifted to the eastern wall giving Mao Mao the final clue to the puzzle. But she doesn't like this, since her dad always told her not to conclude things based on speculation. She later explains her thoughts at the Jade Pavilion, that back at the brothels, there was a skilled courtesan who had received a purchase offer. However, the offer fell through when she started roaming the brothel at night, as if possessed by a demonic spirit, possibly due to stress, but having no recollection of the night before. Eventually, she was bought off and the sleepwalking stopped. Gokuyo concludes that the courtesan didn't want to get sold off. The offer was made by a wealthy merchant who had a wife and even grandchildren. Also, the particular courtesan only had one year left on her serving term, leaving everyone to wonder if Fu Yu was in a similar situation. From that day, Fu Yu was forbidden from leaving her room, with eunuchs placed to watch her. Eventually, the day for Lady Fu Yu to be sent to marry the military officer came. However, Gokuyo asked Mao Mao for the truth, suspecting there was more to what she had told them earlier. They agree to keep her speculation secret, and Mao Mao explains there was actually another courtesan whose purchase offer was called off for the same reason as the first one she mentioned. However, this courtesan later received another purchase offer, but since she was deemed ill due to sleepwalking, the price was cut in half. It was all fraud, however. The two men who made purchase offers knew each other. The woman pretended to be sick to call off the first offer, 
Then the real purchaser made a bid at half the price, as a way for the courtesan to be with a man she loved who could afford her purchase price. Mao Mao thinks Fu Yu is in a similar situation, being that she and the military officer are childhood friends that grew up in the same homeland. This officer showed his valor in a battle against barbarians the other day, and when asked for a reward, he strongly insisted on receiving concubine Fu Yu. As a military officer, he could never think of proposing to a princess. But with Fu Yu being pulled into the rear palace, and her possibly having feelings for her childhood friend, she might have purposely failed at her first dance in front of the emperor, and thus the emperor never touched her, leaving her body pure. That being said, with her being given away, the emperor could have still found interest in her, so she must have feigned somnambulism to avoid his interest. The battles with the barbarians happened in the east, so Fu Yu must have danced on the eastern wall as a prayer for his safe return. But it's all speculation. However, we get to see Lady Fu Yu blushed face to face with the man of her dreams, and upon watching the two lovers, Gyokuyo mentions her envy of her. On another day, we see concubine Li Hua's ladies-in-waiting berating Mao Mao for trying to serve their lady non-luxurious food. She never would have come to the Crystal Pavilion, but unfortunately, the other day when she had done taste testing in front of the Emperor, the Emperor had a personal request for the famous apothecary. With concubine Li Hua unwell, he wanted Mao Mao to cure what ails her. In this country, the word of the Emperor is the word of the heavens. Were she to decline? That would be grounds enough for beheading, so she accepted. However, Mao Mao found it incredible for Li Hua's ladies to treat her like this, despite her being on imperial order. Well, they probably just hate her because she's a servant of Lady Gyokuyo, and with that, she gets quickly thrown out. In the lunch hall, Xiao Lan discusses how Lady Li Hua must still be sick from the white powder, even though it's been banned from the palace entirely. She congratulates Mao Mao on getting orders directly from the Emperor himself, but all Mao Mao thinks is that the Emperor must really not trust the court physician. We then move to the palace kitchen area, because in looking after Lady Li Hua, the first thing Mao Mao set out to do was improve her diet. First, the poison needed to be expelled from her body, so she needed to consume porridge with lots of fiber. She would attempt to bring another meal to Li Hua, only to get scolded by her ladies again telling her this is no place for lowly girls like herself, getting Mao Mao kicked out once again. On another attempt, Mao Mao sees the incredibly rich food being brought by Li Hua's ladies. Even noting their nutritional value, those foods are too heavy for a sick person's weakened stomach. They tried feeding Li Hua, and Mao Mao was absolutely right, seeing the sickly concubine choke on the food needing it to be washed down with water. The ladies blame Mao Mao for ruining the atmosphere, so she gets thrown out again, except this time Jin Shi and Gao Shun spot the occurrence. Another day goes by, with Mao Mao wondering how long until she's beheaded for her inability to complete her task, but this time Jin Shi is here to help her. He tells Li Hua's ladies-in-waiting that it's not befitting of beautiful and talented ladies like you to ignore the Emperor's arrangements, hitting them with the Jin Shi signature charms. Mao Mao finally brings some food to Li Hua, now realizing she still has the will to eat, despite the depression from losing her son. She wipes Li Hua's face, noticing the white powder come off. Oh no, it's the same white powder from before. Mao Mao then goes up to the lady-in-waiting that's in charge of Li Hua's makeup, and with a glaring look, she smacks the lady onto the ground. Oh my god! Mao Mao is perfectly justified, because she's punishing this idiot, as she begins dragging this girl and dumps the banned powder all over her. Mao Mao gets down, coldly telling the woman that the poison would infect her whole body after a while, and she should be glad because she'll still look pretty too, just like her beloved Lady Li Hua. Pale, bloodless skin, sunken eye sockets, a body unable to even eat. How come this fool couldn't understand why this stuff was banned? With Mao Mao dragging the woman to look directly at her sickly master, and pulling her back face to face with Mao Mao, Mao Mao berated her for having no thoughts in her head. With the woman now teary-eyed, Mao Mao yelled at her, asking who would be happy to be poisoned with the same thing that killed their son. Mao Mao then commanded the other ladies with authority to clean this mess on the floor. Afterwards, Mao Mao began taking care of Li Hua every day, while the one who had hid the powder was put in confinement, and the eunuch who was to retrieve the powder was punished by flagellation. One day, with Mao Mao by her side, Lady Li Hua asked her why she didn't just let her die. To which Mao Mao plainly responded, if she truly wanted to die, she could have just stopped eating. She eats because in truth, she wants to live. 
Li Hua reminisces about her deceased baby boy, realizing the truth to this. The days continue with Mao Mao's treatment of Lady Li Hua, and one day, the lady who had been in charge of the makeup was released from confinement. She assured Mao Mao she'd never make that mistake again, telling Mao Mao she'll take over so that Mao Mao could finally rest. With her finally being able to serve her master again, Li Hua's lady-in-waiting shed tears of joy at her recovery. And after about two months, Lady Li Hua was able to walk by herself again. And with Mao Mao now finally able to rest, Lady Li Hua came by to caress and appreciate her savior. The day came for Mao Mao to finally leave the Crystal Pavilion. Li Hua asked her if she's incapable of birthing another child. When Mao Mao responded she didn't know and that Li Hua should try again, Li Hua answered back that the Emperor's love for her is gone. Only for Mao Mao to explain, the Emperor had sent her directly. So Mao Mao believes the Emperor will visit Li Hua soon. Even after hearing this, Li Hua wondered how she could ever beat Lady Gyokuyo. However, Mao Mao answered, It's not a matter of winning and losing. There are hundreds, thousands of flowers in the world. But who can decide whether a peony or a bellflower is more beautiful? To which Li Hua answers she has neither jade eyes or bright hair. But Mao Mao can see Li Hua has other assets. With sheer size and magnificent shape, Mao Mao then tells Li Hua about a secret technique she learned from women at the brothel house involving these assets, which leaves Li Hua flushing red. Unfortunately, Mao Mao doesn't have the right figure for something like that. Puyo. However, Mao Mao answered, It's not a matter of winning and losing. There are hundreds, thousands of flowers in the world. But who can decide whether a peony or a bellflower is more beautiful? To which Li Hua answers she has neither jade eyes or bright hair. But Mao Mao can see Li Hua has other assets. With sheer size and magnificent shape, Mao Mao then tells Li Hua about a secret technique she learned from women at the brothel house involving these assets, which leaves Li Hua flushing red. Unfortunately, Mao Mao doesn't have the right figure for something like that. Wooden swords clash as Jin Shi spars with one of his attendants, Ba Sen, Jin Shi being the victor. While getting scrubbed down afterwards, Jin Shi asks Gao Shun how Mao Mao is doing. Remembering the unexpected sight of Mao Mao slapping and scolding Li Hua's makeup lady. Elsewhere, Mao Mao has lunch with Xiao Lan, who explains there's a rumor of a palace servant who was able to seduce a military officer that was famous for hating women. With Xiao Lan whispering, they say she used an aphrodisiac. Making Mao Mao nervous, remembering the ones she gave to Jin Shi. In the physician's building, Mao Mao shows Guan some fresh Matsutake mushrooms, to which the two enjoy grilled with soy sauce. However, a shaken man barges in, asking if they can make a medicine that cures curses, and then presents his hands to have disgustingly red blotches. But Mao Mao identifies them as just rashes. Probably ointment would do fine. So as she prepares some, the man speaks of the curse that began two nights ago. Trash from the rear palace gets burned in a pit on the west side. The man was doing his usual work and found some weird writing tablets. He tossed them in the trash and the fire illuminated in different colors. Then upon looking at his hands, he saw them suddenly cursed. Mao Mao then began sticking one of these tablets into a fire and change the color by sprinkling different materials onto it, explaining this is like how fireworks work. She then explains what's on his hand is no curse, but simply that there was material on the tablets that night that gave him a rash. So with that, she hands him his ointment cure. Jin Shi then enters to applaud Mao Mao's work. He takes her to learn more about the burning tablets, and orders Gao Shun to find anyone else with the rashes. As Mao Mao wanders away, she surmises the colored wood tablets are most likely some kind of code. Back in the Jade Pavilion, the ladies in waiting get Mao Mao dressed up for the garden party. Twice a year, the emperor and his high officials gather in the courtyard to enjoy food and entertainment. Since the emperor is unmarried and has no princess consort, it is customary to bring the upper first rank concubines the four high-ranking concubines who are the best contenders for Empress Consort. There is no particular task to complete at the event. They're just invited guests who must follow the Emperor. Ying Hua gets fired up, with this being Princess Ling Li's first public appearance, and with this being a rare event with all four high-ranking concubines 
is going to be an all-out war to show which is best. Later, Gao Shun reports not finding anyone with the rash burns on their arms, so they can only hope things go smoothly at the garden party tomorrow. At the sight of the dolled-up Lady Gyokuyo, her ladies gush at her beauty. It is said that crimson suits her better than anyone else in the land. Gyokuyo presents them all jewelry to represent them as her ladies, and then they hold Mao Mao to prep her for the event. And after wiping her face, Mao Mao sighs because they caught her. The four high concubines Gyokuyo, the precious consort, Li Hua, the wise consort, Li Shu, the virtuous consort, and A Du, the pure consort, enter the garden area. Jin Shi comes to greet Gyokuyo's group, mostly to check on Mao Mao, and upon seeing her face, he's stunlocked, not recognizing her at first with her beauty. He asks if she's wearing makeup because her freckles are gone, but actually, she isn't. She simply removed them. The freckles were actually makeup. That's why they're gone. With Jin Shi confused, she explains that every day she puts dried clay on her face to add freckles, so she'd technically been wearing makeup the entire time. This only left him more confused. Why would she do such a thing? Well, it's to prevent being dragged into a back alley and hearing her horrible upbringing leaves Jin Shi shocked. Even though Mao Mao lived near the brothels, not every man left sexually satisfied. Some had empty wallets, violent tendencies, and venereal diseases. She knew a short, skinny, ugly girl rarely would be a target. And even though she never got dragged into a back alley, she still got kidnapped. Hearing her story made Jin Shi feel regretful apologizing for not being able to police those men. To Mao Mao, it's whatever though. A buyer can't tell if one was kidnapped or just sold off legally. It still makes Mao Mao mad, but it's not Jin Shi's fault things ended up this way. He apologized to her again, getting close and leaving a hairpin in her hair with his face blushed. Mao Mao examined it, not quite sure why he gave her this hairpin, and all the ladies in waiting came by to congratulate her. But before Mao Mao could get an explanation on what this pin meant, the sounds of drum beating meant the event was starting. With the high concubines sitting in their appropriate positions and the emperor watching from the center. Gyokuyo's ladies in waiting huddled together to deal with the cold winds at the event. And watching the event, Mao Mao feels like the arrangement is made to instill rivalry between the four concubines. Amongst them, holding Princess Ling Li is the Empress Dowager, Han Shi, the current emperor's mother. With her youthful looks, Mao Mao is disturbed to hear she gave birth to the emperor at 11 years old. We learn An Shi has two children, the Emperor and his younger brother, who is rumored to be too sickly to leave the house. Behind Mao Mao and Gui Yen, Ying Hua is upset hearing Li Hua's ladies calling them ugly, and especially hiring that ugly girl Mao Mao, which leaves Mao Mao surprised that they can't recognize she's right in front of them, especially with Mao Mao having scared the one insulting them, saying she'd perform all sorts of dangerous experiments on her body. Mao Mao then who she is, frightening the girl and making her drag her friend away. Looking at Mao Mao, Gyokuyo's ladies always felt sympathetic. Growing in poverty, she ruined her face daily because of her distrust in men. Two months of bullying at the Crystal Pavilion, and despite all this, Mao Mao is always thinking about taking care of them. They conclude this is why Lord Jin Shi looks after her. But Mao Mao thinks they're totally delusional. Anadua's ladies in purple begin scolding Li Shu's ladies for dressing Li Shu and another, the current emperors. With the emperor passing and this concubine still pure, she eventually became the current emperors. Mao Mao ponders this until she hears that it was actually Li Shu who was five years ago at the age of nine, actually the mother-in-law, not Adua who was 30 at the time. As Li Shu passes by Mao Mao, Mao Mao remarks a white dress would suit her better. And the Crimson obviously clashes with Lady Gyokuyo. Elsewhere in the event, as Mao Mao is walking, she stumbles upon a man named Li Haku, who offers her a hairpin. It looks like he's handing them out to everyone, so no servant feels left out. Thus, she takes one before he brightly takes off, making her think he's like a dog. Looking at the pin, Lady Li Hua arrives, believing Mao Mao should have more presenting Mao Mao with her own personal pin before taking off. However, what is she to do with all these pins? Later, the food tasting for the high concubines begins. Mao Mao handles things just fine, but the taste tests jellyfish. The emperor's cook would never make a mistake like this. So, Mao Mao complains Mao Mao, who is oddly happy despite swallowing the toxin. He grabs her arm, trying to take her to the infirmary, but she tells him she already coughed it up, even though she was spazzing on the ground? With a gluttonous beauty, she asks him for the rest of the soup, 
only for him to call her an idiot. He explains the minister tried the soup after she declared it to be poisoned, just to verify the truth, and he collapsed from it. Mao Mao then pulls out an emetic agent from her dress, which will help the minister throw it all up. Jinshi takes it, but still drags Mao Mao with a more serious attitude that she isn't used to. She prefers him like this somewhat. At the palace infirmary, as Mao Mao pukes, she marvels at the good drug Lady Gyokuyo, so Mao Mao suggests bringing a certain someone. So they meet with Lady Li Shu, and as they exchange greetings, Mao Mao spots her scratching her arm. Mao Mao lifts Li Shu's sleeves to see her covered in rashes. She knew it. Li Shu has an allergy to mackerel. Mao Mao explains that she herself is allergic to buckwheat. She had once tried to build a tolerance for it, but it just made her throat swell and her breathing difficult. Even just a little would cause rashes. Li Shu wondered how she knew, so Mao Mao explained the vinegar dish used a different ingredient from the usual one, meaning Lady Li Shu's dish got swapped with Lady Gyokuyo's dish by mistake. Upon hearing this, Li Shu's lady-in-waiting's eyes widened as if she had made a mistake. As Mao Mao explains, this is not about Li Shu being a picky eater, and that feeding her something like this knowingly is the same as poisoning her. This makes the lady-in-waiting sweat and further regret. And as Mao Mao hands her a list of things Li Shu needs to avoid eating, Mao Mao gives one of her most deadly glares. Jin Shi concluded the server had truly messed up, with Mao Mao speculating the poison wasn't actually meant for Gyokuyo, but instead Li Shu. And with everything concluding, Jin Shi continued to ponder if this assassination was somehow related to the colored burning tablets from earlier. A Lady Li Shu's taster. Then, one more. An outsider that touched the rim of the bowl. That outsider is the one who most likely poisoned the food. But Gao Shun questions why Li Shu's taster fingerprints are also there. Mao Mao answers that the taster was most likely harassing Lady Li Shu, not knowing it was poisoned. Gao Shun is surprised to hear a lady in waiting bullying a high-ranking concubine. However, Mao Mao opens with, this is all just conjecture, reminding Gao Shun of Li Shu's dress color, remarking it as odd that knowing what Gyokuyo's dress color was going to be, they hadn't recommended a different one. Made Li Shu appear like an idiot who can't read the room. She then remembered Adua's ladies scolding Li Shu's for not doing their jobs. The palace is full of enemies, and the only people a concubine can tr- How he can turn her down. Mao Mao meets with him, and he immediately asks who she is, to vouch for her to leave. He scolds her for trying to exploit him, a belief as not even the highest ranking officials can afford one of them, but two hairpins, one with rose quartz and one with silver. The hawker realizes those are from people who obviously outrank him. Pulling her bargaining chips, Li Haku folds to her gambit. Sometime later, Jin Shi finished all the paperwork he was buried in. So now with the time to visit Mao Mao, Madam is covering for Mao Mao, having learned she was kidnapped over 10 months ago, but wants her to bring more young men like Li Haku so they can drain their bank accounts over a long period of time. Soon after, Mao Mao finally returns home to meet her father, who casually welcomes her home. As he continues to work, she shares all of her experiences in the rear palace and everything she'd gone through for hours on end. And by the end, as the father watches her rest, he thinks of her ending up at the rear palace to be a twist of fate. The day begins with Mao Mao just getting out of bed. A little girl from a brothel knocks on her house door and drags Mao Mao back to a brothel house to see a man and a woman passed out. She hits herself to focus up and she and one of the courtesans perform CPR on the two. And afterwards, Mao Mao successfully saves them. Post-success, she analyzes the situation. The two who had collapsed were a courtesan and her customer, the room filled with the scent of alcohol and tobacco. She notices wheat, a pipe, and some tobacco leaves. The girl from earlier who brought Mao Mao over brings Mao Mao some charcoal she had requested. And when Mao Mao tells the girl to bring her father later, as the girl leaves, she has a devious look on her face. Mao Mao's father enters the scene, and while examining the room, he remarks Mao Mao's medical work to be not bad. He teaches her, as he's still much further ahead in terms of medical knowledge, and she still has a lot to learn. As they're enjoying snacks as well as payment from the brothel's proprietor, Mao Mao speculates the event being a double self-end, where the man can afford to buy out the courtesan, and instead the two lovers chose to end their lives together. 
but he seemed quite handsome and wore expensive clothing, not really the type to be short on money or women. Mao Mao then noticed the little girl from earlier walk by, heading towards the room where the man was staying. She followed. Seeing the little girl about to end his life, Mao Mao pulls the blade away. However, the little girl tells Mao Mao this man deserves to die. The little girl desperately reaches to take the knife back, but Mao Mao headbutts her, leaving the little girl in tears. Then, one of the courtesans enters, and upon seeing what had transpired, asks to speak to Mao Mao about this. The courtesan explains that the man was always a problem customer. He'd sweet talk a courtesan and insinuate on buying her out, but when he got tired of one, he'd dump her and move on. He was widely hated. Some woman tried to stab him even, poisoned in the past by another courtesan. However, his rich merchant father pampers him, settling everything with money. This little girl's older sister got dumped by him too. On the day of her buyout, he suddenly cancelled, even though she loved him. The courtesan who drank the poison today was close with the older sister as well. They pleaded with Mao Mao to keep this all a secret. Back at home, Mao Mao still pondered the whole event, thinking it doesn't make sense for the man to have committed a double self-end, with Mao Mao's father reminding her not to make conclusions based on conjecture. As it's clear, he's already figured out what happened. Thinking of all the events, she realizes it was definitely a murder attempt by the courtesan, and not a double self-end. The courtesan used drinks laced with tobacco poison, and even though the man was on guard from previous poisoning attempts, she convinced him to drink it by drinking some herself, with a special trick. Two cups, one drink. Different drinks have different densities. Pouring a lighter drink slowly over a heavier drink, one can create a pretty looking layered drink. The courtesan then used a wheat stalk to drink just the lower layer, without raising suspicion. But the top layer contained the poison, from which the man drank and passed out from. Afterward, she drank from the top as well, but just a little, not enough to kill her. The beautiful courtesan who seemed quite fragile was actually quite clever. And Mao Mao wondered if all the girls in the brothel were in on it, because she shouldn't conclude based on conjecture. Mao Mao really missed this pleasure district. In essence, it's no different from the rear palace, both being a garden and a cage. The stale, trapped air poisons everyone. The courtesans eat the poison around them to become a sweet poison themselves. Mao Mao then went to take a refreshing bath at the Verdigris house. One of the three princesses, Mei Mei, enters, and while the two bathe together, she expresses how much Pai Rin, Joka, and the Madam missed her. Even though Mao Mao couldn't tell, the Madam was acting normal so she would feel welcome. Mei Mei suggests Mao Mao visit the annex before she leaves, and when she does, it's a dark, depressing sight. Before she knew it, Mao Mao's three-day homecoming had come to an end. She met back with Lihaku, who was totally caught up by Pai Rin, but now Mao Mao has to come back with new customers every time. Coming back, Mao Mao wonders why Jin Shi has such an intense stare. She tries to leave to go change, but Jin Shi stops her, telling Mao Mao he'll be waiting for her at the parlor. They meet later, and he seems really upset for some reason. He asked her about her time home, but more importantly, how was Li Haku? Mao Mao wonders how he knows who that is, but she answers he was simply her guarantor. Jin Shi became depressed, though, that his pin lost out to a consolation one. Ooh, he was totally jealous. She apologized for not using his hairpin, but she couldn't think of a repayment that he would enjoy. Jin Shi became concerned. What kind of repayment? Mao Mao explains she granted Li Haku a night of blissful dreams, which made him very happy. And hearing this, Jin Shi became shaken, and he dropped his cup completely stunlocked. After Mao Mao cleaned him up, she came out to Lady Gyokuyo cracking up in laughter and Hong Yen scolds her with a smack for breaking Jin Shi's heart over this misunderstanding. On another day, Gao Shun wonders how long Jin Shi is gonna sulk. He's not used to Jin Shi responding so childishly. He remembers it took considerable effort to get Lady Gyokuyo to stop laughing and explain everything, clearing up that Li Haku received payment from Mao Mao by having him meet a star courtesan. That being said, Jin Shi had put a lot of effort to clear his work, only to hear Mao Mao had suddenly left with another man. It had to have been shocking. Later that night, a man barged into Jin Shi's office asking for help. And the next day, Jin Shi met with Mao Mao, as he had learned a bureaucrat he was acquainted with died while drinking the night before. He wanted to know if Mao Mao really thought alcohol had killed him. Elsewhere, Mao Mao explains that anyone who likes alcohol should know that it is poison in essence. 
Drinking constantly can sicken the organs. Drinking too much in one sitting can lead to death. Jinshi then explains that Conan died at a party for a group of co-workers and heard he had a lot to drink, but he was well known for being able to really handle a lot. Conan was a dynamic warrior who drank entire jars of alcohol and had a well-liked personality. Jinshi then had Mao Mao test the alcohol from the event. No poison in it, but it certainly was a sweet drink that had salt added to it. Conan had a serious sweet tooth, never laying a finger on even the finest smoked meats and rock salts. Even though he used to like spicy food, one day he developed a sweet tooth. With this bit of information, Mau Mau also learned there were rock salts, mooncakes, and dried meat at the party. She then asked him to retrieve the jar Master Conan was drinking from. After reading a report and examining the broken jar, she found there was salt on the inside. Strange how Conan had developed a sweet tooth. When the jar contained so much salt, it left crystals behind when it dried. Salt is essential to the human body, but too much can be poisonous. So given the amount he drank with salt included, Mau Mau closed the case with salt poisoning being the reason. She then hands Jin Shi the report, saying Conan had lost the ability to taste salt and thus couldn't tell he was drinking it. Mau Mau had learned that many years ago, he had lost his wife and child to an epidemic. And from that day on, he worked all day every day. There is an illness where one loses sense of taste caused by an unbalanced diet or stress. Mau Mau had no clue who would have put excessive salt in Conan's drink, but they could have done it just to prank him, not necessarily with malicious intent. However, Jin Shi still mourned the man's passing. Conan had helped him a lot when he was younger, but with the night coming to a close, not everything was peaceful, as a woman sunk to the bottom of the moat. The next day, Mau Mau examines the woman, learning she was a servant from the rear palace. Physician Guan is usually supposed to handle stuff like this, but he's a little baby. However, Mao Mao can't do this alone as she's not allowed to touch corpses. Jin Shi finds it surprising even though Mao Mao is used to the sight of them, since the Pleasure District itself is only one step away from lawless chaos. However, she made a promise to her father to never touch corpses because humans can become medicinal ingredients too. Given her curiosity, it wouldn't be long before she starts to dig up graves so she must never cross that line. The court physician freaks out having to give an autopsy, but just from looking, Mau Mau can see she's tall, wore hard wooden shoes, had bandages on one foot, fingers all red. It must have been cold in that water. Jin Shi explains the woman was in fact a servant who worked normally the other day. The guard believes she climbed the wall last night and threw herself in the moat. Mau Mau can't tell if it was a self-end but is sure she had to be assisted by someone. After all, there are no ladders on the wall and no climbing tools, with the walls being at least four times Mau Mau's height. But there is a place where concubine Fuyu had climbed up to dance on walls under the moon previously. Still though, it would have been difficult for the servant who died to have climbed up, given her bound feet. Foot binding is a custom where small feet are considered beautiful. It's not done to all women, but they do have a distinct walking style when you see them. Mau Mau is still unsure whether or not it was a self-end or murder, but she believes the woman was still alive when she had fallen in. She must have clawed at the walls to try to climb out as her fingers were bloodied and red. Self-end or murder? Mau Mau would never take her own life. She'd hate to be killed by someone else too, because if she died, she wouldn't be able to test any more drugs or poisons. Jin Shi walked over to her, wondering what she was lost in thought about. Mau Mau replied, she wondered what kind of poison she would use to die. She's not trying to die, but nobody knows when it'll happen. Even if it's not something they wished for, a malicious third party can cause an undesired death like Master Conan. Mau Mau reflects on all the horrifying events that had transpired. With a moment of silence between her and Jin Shi, she then asks him to make sure, if he's ever tasked with executing her, that he makes sure it's with poison. He freaks out, wondering where that's coming from, but logically, if Mau Mau were ever to make a mistake, he would probably be the one to be given the order. Despite now realizing she might be stepping on Jin Shi's heart a bit, she apologizes but still acknowledges she's a commoner. Her life could be taken away over the slightest mistake. Jin Shi tells her he'd never do such a thing, only for her to respond, it's not a would or would not type of issue. It's a can or cannot, making his face grow solemn, acknowledging the truth in her words. Mau Mau later learned the dead servant was at the garden party where the poisoning took place. 
they found a will with some relevant content and closed the case as a self-end. On another day, Gao Shun reports finally finding the one with the burn marks on their arms from the colored fire. It's Fa Ming from the Garden Pavilion, head lady in waiting under concubine A Duo. It's lunchtime and Xiao Lan discusses the rumor of the woman who had self-ended by jumping in the moat. Hearing it was the woman who poisoned Lady Li Shu's food at the garden party. The woman apparently served concubine A Duo, who is apparently going to lose her title and be replaced by a younger concubine soon. Lady A Duo is one year older than the emperor at 35. She had a male baby with him once, but lost him. Mao Mao wondered if Li Hua would be replaced if she couldn't have another baby. There's also no guarantee that Lady Gyokuyo will continue to have the emperor's love. Even the most beautiful flowers will wilt over time. The flowers of the rear palace are meaningless unless they bear fruit. Later, Mao Mao attends a tea party at the Jade Pavilion with guest Lady Li Shu, with Li Shu's taster a little distraught seeing Mao Mao, but it's not like Mao Mao would bite her head off. The tea pouring begins with a bit of honey. However, Li Shu seems freaked out, with her ladies speaking in hushed whispers about her being a picky eater again. Mao Mao breathes a sigh at the sight of Li Shu's stupid ladies, and signals to Gyokuyo the tea isn't a good idea. Gokuyo orders the tea to be switched out with hot ginger water, and with the scoffing expressions from Li Shu's ladies, Mao Mao gets even more annoyed. Outside the living room, Mao Mao sees Jin Shi's arrival. Looks like he was the one who arranged the tea party. She tries to leave, but of course he has to stop her for something. He wants her to start working at the Garnet Pavilion tomorrow to find out more information on the woman who tried to poison Lady Li Shu. Mansions are painted in their master's colors. Figuratively speaking, concubine Gyokuyo's Jade Pavilion feels homey. Li Hua's Crystal Pavilion felt refined and noble, while the Garnet Pavilion, home to A Duo, was practical and simple, yet polished and classy. A Duo, the pure, enters, with Mao Mao detailing her as neither showy nor voluptuous. She has an androgynous, almost gallant kind of beauty. If dressed differently, she'd pass as a young civil servant. She might even look better in a riding suit, instead of her skirt and dress. But why does she remind Mao Mao of someone? They're shown around the place by Fa Ming, as their task is to help clean the place. Mao Mao notices the servants at the Garnet Pavilion to be hard workers, something the idiots from the Crystal Pavilion could learn from. Spending time with Fa Ming, Mao Mao finds her to be friendly, observant, and praising of others. In her guest's sleeping quarters, Mao Mao swells the sweetness of the candle before laying in bed for the night. The next day as she works, she wonders if the mastermind behind the poisoning was really here. All the servants here are hardworking, even head lady-in-waiting Fa Ming. With her being well past her prime though and having good qualities for a wife, Mao Mao wondered why she never married. Was it to dedicate herself to concubine A Duo? Hmm. Strong loyalty is a possible motive for poisoning. With a new concubine coming to enter, Adua's position is most at risk. But what if a vacancy opened elsewhere first? This emperor is only interested in ripened fruit, so he doesn't visit Lady Li Shu. That's fine, given her age of 14, but one could also claim she's not serving her role as concubine. If someone were to poison someone for Adua, targeting Li Shu isn't out of the question. Mao Mao then gets called to help another servant, and in this room are jars full of honey, delivered by Fa Ming's family as they own an apiary a place where bees are kept. No wonder there was so much honey here despite it being so expensive. Meeting the sweet smell from the candle last night was honey. Mao Mao then notices Li Shu wandering by the Garnet Pavilion, but why only with her taster? Later, Mao Mao gives her report to Jin Shi, saying the prime suspect is Fa Ming, given she has bandages wrapped around her arms. The colored text plates that were burned in the garbage fire were wrapped in a woman's dress with burns on the sleeves. But she doesn't feel the gentle Fa Ming could be part of a conspiracy. Jin Shi does some flirty harassing with some honey, and something clicks in Mao Mao's mind, putting all the pieces together. There's something about the honey. Gyo Kuyo arrives, not so happy to see Jin Shi's attempts to stick honey in Mao Mao's mouth, but he runs away. Mao Mao then heads with Gao Shun to Li Shu's pavilion. She tries to ascertain why Li Shu doesn't like honey, but she doesn't have a particular allergen to it. She just remembers there was a life-threatening event when she was a baby that involved it, and her nurses told her not to eat it. Then, when Mao Mao mentions Fa Ming's name, 
Li Shu gives a distraught look. Afterwards, Mama wants to know if there's a place she can learn about past events from the rear palace. So Gao Shun gets her some records from the palace library. She learns 17 years ago, when the current emperor was still a prince, he had a son with concubine A Dua. The baby is gone now, but was born around the same time as the prior emperor's son, the current emperor's little brother. A Dua used to be the current emperor's only concubine, and she was apparently his foster sibling. Their baby had been delivered by Dr. Lo Men, which shocked Mao Mao, but she always had a hunch. With several of the herbs growing in the rear palace being the same ones she used growing up, someone must have transplanted them there. A man who drags his feet like an old woman. A doctor overqualified for the position of a pleasure district apothecary. A former eunuch with a bone removed from one knee. Why was her father expelled from the palace? The next day, Mao Mao presents something to Fa Ming, something they need to talk about. Fa Ming begins to chop bread, served with honey, pleasantries normal for a guest to the pavilion. However, Fa Ming's smile seems uncanny. Mao Mao asks where they're moving to, because with everything packed, it's pretty clear now that A Duo is being replaced because she's infertile. Mao Mao asks for details about what happened during the birth of A Duo's child. And when Mao Mao explains her father was the doctor, Fa Ming jolts up in astonishment. Mao Mao deduced that with A Duo's baby being born at the same time as the Empress Dowager's, the Imperial doctor had given priority to the Empress, taking too long to make it to A Duo. She lost her uterus and lost her baby soon after. Fa Ming stares completely distraught because Mao Mao has figured it all out. Despite her father being a quack as claimed by Fa Ming, Fa Ming looks at Mao Mao coldly with the eyes of a killer. As Mao Mao presents the cause of A Duo's death, a flower and some honey. Many flowers have poison in them, like aconite or azalea. Their nectar can be poisonous too. Fa Ming knows that now, but back then she didn't. She didn't realize regular honey with no poison, what she believed was good for health, could have been harmful to a newborn baby. With A Duo still recovering, she trusted her head lady-in-waiting, but that very trust was what caused the baby's death. The cause was then treated as a mystery, and with Mao Mao's father blamed for the mistakes, he was expelled. But later, Fa Ming learned the actual cause of the baby's death. Someone taught her that honey can be poisonous to babies. She had to make sure A Duo never found that out. That's why she tried to eliminate Lady Li Shu. During the Emperor's previous reign, Li Shu was close to A Duo. They were both fond of each other. A young girl taken from her parents, a woman who could no longer give birth. There may have been a type of codependency that developed. During that time, Fa Ming learned from Li Shu that she almost died eating honey as a baby, and to stop A Duo from ever hearing that story, she chased Li Shu away from the Garnet Pavilion and tried to poison Li Shu to her end. Fa Ming asks what Mao Mao wants to keep quiet. With a murderous look on her face, she tells Mao Mao she'll give her anything, but Mao Mao tells her it's meaningless. Fa Ming walked to the window, speaking of everything she admired about A Duo, and now deeply basks in the pain of causing the person she respected the most to lose her child. Back then, A Duo even told her ladies not to blame themselves. With a look of dread on her face, A Duo told them she knew a baby could die from even the slightest illness. She took her losses gracefully, but Fa Ming knew her lady cried herself to sleep every night, and reflecting on it shook Fa Ming to her core. Mao Mao knows no matter what, once she reports this to Jin Shi, Fa Ming will receive capital punishment. So, Mao Mao offers her a solution. At night, Mao Mao returns to her quarters, completely worn out, having worn layers of stiffened oil paper, just in case an altercation would have happened. Reporting back to Jin Shi, he got a report that Fa Ming turned herself in as Li Shu's poisoner. Jin Shi asks if Mao Mao knows anything about this, but she denies it. In the report, Fa Ming's motive was listed as only wanting to keep Lady A Duo in as a main concubine. However, A Duo's relocation to a detached palace in the south was already decided a long time ago, before any of this. As Mao Mao works, she reflects on letting Fa Ming choose her own destiny. She let her self-report in a way that prevented A Duo from ever finding out that she was the cause of the baby's death, even if Fa Ming were to die for it. Later that night, Mao Mao climbs up the castle wall to look at the sky, reflecting on Fa Ming's execution. A Duo appears before her, and she's set to depart the rear palace tomorrow. The two enjoy some drinks together, 
and Adul explains that when her son left, she returned to being the Emperor's friend, not his concubine. She was given the title only in pity, wondering why she held on to it for so long. She then poured the alcohol over the moat where her servant jumped to self-end, to mourn her death. With Mau Mau climbing down the wall, a man's voice hollers at her, wondering what she's doing up there. Oh, it's Jin Shi. Well, this is awkward, so Mau Mau tries to leave, but he grabs onto her. She looks back at him, seeing tears dropping down his eyes. He pleads with her to keep him warm, just a little longer. The next day, Aduo returns her crown of pure concubine to Jin Shi, the very crown that will be bestowed to the next high concubine chosen. Looking at Aduo and Jin Shi together, Mao Mao knew Aduo resembled someone, and they might as well swap outfits. Wait, last night, Aduo mentioned something about her son leaving her. Why didn't she say it died? It could almost be interpreted that her son is still alive. What if Aduo's and the Dowager's sons were swapped? What if, despite the medical need for Aduo's delivery, Mao Mao's father was dragged away to tend to the Empress's baby? With Aduo knowing her baby would never been given priority, she allowed her son to be swapped with the Empress's to give him a chance to live a better life. What if people found out the babies were swapped later? If that was after the one baby had died, it would explain why Mao Mao's dad was physically punished for not noticing. This would explain why the Emperor's younger brother is in a delicate position, and why concubine Aduo, who's supposed to be a realist, stayed in the rear palace for so long. Mao Mao sighed at the ridiculousness of this speculation. There's no way that could be true. Later, inside Jin Shi's office, he reads a list of Fa Ming's family and those connected to them. But why is Mao Mao listed amongst them? After Fa Ming's death, her family's assets were confiscated and all underwent varying degrees of corporal punishment. Fa Ming was determined to be the sole perpetrator in Li Xu's assassination attempt, so A Duo suffered no blame. The list Jin Shi received also included people who did business with Fa Ming's family. The kidnappers who sold off Mao Mao were included in this list, hence why Mao Mao's name is here. But with Fa Ming's punishment, Jin Shi fights with keeping Mao Mao's ties concealed. He doesn't want to lose Mao Mao, even knowing she'd follow any order a higher up would give her, even death. Having lunch with Xiao Lan, Mao Mao learns that the daughters of any family that had done business with Fa Ming's are being fired from the palace. Mao Mao thinks it's bad timing, knowing if she's let go and sent back home, the madam will probably put her into concubine work for not bringing back any more men. She ran desperately to find Jin Shi, Knowing about the layoffs, she asks what's going to happen to her. Jin Shi shows her the list of those associated with Fa Ming's family business, the page specifically with Mao Mao's name on it. And he asks her what she wants to do. She thinks as Lady Gyokuyo's lady-in-waiting, she can test for poisons and hang out in the medical office. She's been enjoying her current life, but being just a servant, she knows she's in no position to request to stay. She answers Jin Shi, telling him she'll do as he orders. Manual labor, cooking, or tasting, She's almost pleading to stay. Jin Shi gets up, telling her he understands. But Mao Mao is disappointed to hear she's being compensated and let go. Later, he's completely depressed, sitting in a corner. After a week of being fired, Mao Mao returned home to the pleasure district. But Gyo Kyuyo wasn't happy about this. Gao Shun thinks back, remembering it's always been challenging to find Jin Shi a new toy to replace his favorite one, even from when he was little. No, Mao Mao wasn't the same thing. Maybe Jin Shi had let her go because he didn't want to treat her like a tool. Back at the Vertigris house, Mao Mao was getting dolled up by the three princesses. Her workplace tonight is a noble's party outside the brothel. Calling a courtesan to one's own mansion costs quite a sum. Calling one of the princesses is equivalent to what most make in a year, but calling all three at once? There must be no limits to how rich a rich person could be. Mao Mao was simply going to make the princesses look better in comparison. Luckily, she was paid more than expected when leaving the rear palace, so she was able to avoid getting sold off into quarters in work, at least for now. As they head out in carriage, Mao Mao reflects on how the madam really wanted her to become a courtesan, but she can't recite poetry or play the arhu, and she absolutely cannot dance. She's just an apothecary's daughter with no interest outside of medicine. As they walk through the mansion, Mao Mao notices every piece of furniture to be unimaginably expensive. They arrive at the entertainment room. Supposedly, Lihaku was the one who arranged the introduction with these high-ranking nobles. 
The courtesans then displayed their impressive skills in song and dance. Mau Mau didn't mind the work, but smiling was getting exhausting. She found a familiar man in the back. Wondering if he was bored, she decided to sit by him. However, he just muttered the words, leave me alone. Noticing who it is, she utters his name and he's surprised to see her, telling her that makeup changes her look considerably. He's shocked to learn she's working part-time as a courtesan and sweating profusely upon hearing she hasn't taken any customers yet. He asks what if he bought her out, which he doesn't believe to be a bad idea. She wouldn't mind working at the rear palace again. Jin Shi sighs. He thought she quit because she hated it there, but he misunderstood. She was trying to convince him to let her stay. Despite there having been a lot of trouble, she loved performing as a taster. The only thing she missed were her poison experiments. Jinshi laughed, warmly telling her she should probably stop playing with poison, but accepts that's who she is. A woman he endears, who doesn't express her feelings clearly. He tries to touch her face, but she pulls away, telling him rules are rules. He continually asks with persistence, so she sighs, allowing only just his fingers. He then wipes off some of her lipstick and gives it a kiss, leaving Mau Mau wide-eyed as he smiles with her lipstick on his lips. She blushes, looking away in embarrassment, and the three princesses laugh joyously looking at them, with Gao Shun even giving approval. Afterwards, the princesses playfully prodded Mau Mau, asking who the charming man was to her. As Mau Mau spent her days working at the Vertigris house, mostly doing her regular apothecary work, she wondered how everyone was doing back at the rear palace. In a bath with the madam, the madam asked Mau Mau if she was going back to the rear palace, but Mau Mau wasn't sure. One night, she finds herself unable to sleep and steps outside to get some air. As she sits in the cold, it begins to snow, and she began reminiscing on her times at the rear palace. Sitting in those memories, she wondered what was going to happen from now on. A few days later, a beautiful noble came to the pleasure district bringing the madam joy at all the money being offered to buy the courtesan with the apothecary skills. The noble then displayed a strange herb growing from an insect as a gift that brought the courtesan extreme joy. In the evening, Jin Shi sits across from the emperor to drink. He reflects on no matter how hard he tries, he can only slightly outperform a regular person, but instead, he's been granted an appearance more beautiful than anyone. With the things he truly wants so far out of reach, he used to be dissatisfied, but now has gotten over it, and now uses his superior tools to his advantage. After all, he's just a child floundering on the emperor's palm. That's why he manages the rear palace, or whatever the emperor wishes. That's the only way he can choose his own path. Back at the Vertigris house, Mei Mei helps Mau Mau prepare for her leave back to the palace, throwing in tons of makeup Mau Mau doesn't think she needs. The princesses gather around, hoping Mau Mau brings back plenty of rich men to the brothel. At night, as Mau Mau rests next to her father, he pats her head saying they'll both be lonely again at night, but at least she can come home anytime. Mau Mau reflects on how even though she has no mother, she has a caring dad, a nosy granny, and a lively group of big sisters to keep her company. On the day of her leave, as Jin Shi waits, Mau Mau walks towards him, all dolled up with her entourage, and seeing her makes him blush. In the carriage ride, Mau Mau blames him for all the unwanted attention. He's about to counter by saying she looks beautiful, but he stops, saying, It's nothing. When they arrive at the palace entrance, even guards gawk at her, making Jin Shi a little annoyed. So, Jin Shi tells her to go back to her normal freckled form, as he feels the need to block other men from being around her, but she has no idea what he's doing. They arrive at Jin Shi's house, Mao Mao's new workplace. With her being fired once, she can't be put back in the same position, so now she'll be working in the outer court, outside of the rear palace. Meeting with Jin Shi in the living room, Mao Mao is surprised to hear she won't be doing any servant work, but instead will be preparing for the court lady exam. In the morning, she meets with Jin Shi's court attendant, Shui Lian, to help serve breakfast. There, Mao Mao is surprised to learn that there are no other attendants, but understands when Shui Lian explains the young girl girls would always cause Jin Shi trouble, such as leaving underwear made out of their hair in his closet. Ew. Seeing the tired Jin Shi waking, Mao Mao thinks he has so much wasted sex appeal. If another woman saw this, she'd lose herself easily. Even guys might pounce on him right away. He truly has a sin-inducing air about him. Mao Mao then wonders if she could sell his scent as an aphrodisiac. As Mao Mao and Gao Shun go about their day, Mao Mao has a new perspective on Jin Shi. He's apparently always been a busy guy. 
Gao Shan showed Mao Mao around the outer court, but there's so many buildings she had a hard time keeping up. Her ability to learn things she isn't interested in is pretty below average. After dropping off some charcoal into Jin Shi's office, outside, Mao Mao notices the glares from some ladies. Perhaps they're sizing up the new girl. Mao Mao describes court ladies of the outer court to be like secretaries. They have the right qualifications, background, and education, unlike the hodgepodge of female officials at the rear palace, which would explain the outer court ladies' self-esteems. The girls come up to Mao Mao questioning why someone like her was assigned directly to Master Jin Shi. However, Mao Mao can only focus on how well fed the woman barking at her is. Mao Mao doesn't think it's a good idea for her to stay silent, so she asks them if they're jealous. Whoops, wrong choice of words. Mao Mao then approaches with better tact, telling them she's not getting special treatment. After all, she's ugly. Why would Jin Shi go after meatless chicken bones when there are heaps of delicious abalones and boar meat in front of him? Even so, one of the women still questions why he'd hire Mao Mao, so she pulls out her ace in the hole, her wounds on her arm that look especially messed up since she had tried some burn medicine the other day. Mao Mao meekly tells them Lord Jin Shi has a heart of gold, giving someone as pauper as herself a way to make a living. The ladies then take their leave. However, Jin Shi had secretly been there all along, wondering if Mao Mao gets harassed like this often, but she escapes without answering. The day of the exams came, but Mao Mao failed. This doesn't deter her happiness though, as she still gets excited finding many herbs to pick. However, one of the court ladies comes by to whack her head, telling Mao Mao not to go beyond that point towards the military area, all while an onlooker smiles, having observed them. Another day comes and with the arrival of the new pure consort that replaces Adol, Mao Mao is being assigned as her teacher for some reason by Lady Gyokuyo and Li Hua. Arriving at the assignment, Mao Mao kicks Jin Shi out, with the lesson being for ladies only. The room is already seated with the four high concubines and their head ladies in waiting, with Mao Mao spotting the new pure consort, Lu Lan. With her age being 17, the emperor will probably spend more time with her. Mao Mao begins giving her teaching lessons based on all of her experience from the Vertigris house. Some laugh in joy at the techniques, some blush in embarrassment, with even Li Xu's soul leaving her body. <laughs> After the day's lesson, Jin Shi is surprised to see Gyokuyo and Li Hua pleased, Li Xu wishing she'd never heard any of this, and Lu Lan unfazed. Later that night, an explosion occurs in the palace, and Mao Mao wakes up to the scurrying of soldiers, but decides to go back to bed because it's cold. The man who observed Mao Mao earlier, Lo Han, investigates, reporting nothing to his associates even though there's a peculiar pipe on the ground. The next day, while getting distracted by herbs per usual, Mao Mao spots Li Haku, who adorns a new colored belt. He must have gotten a promotion. She heard after meeting Pai Rin, he fell in love with her, and even though he can't afford a night with her on his salary, he has tea in the area at least to see her. After the two chat about Mao Mao's transfer to the outer palace, Li Haku explains he's been brought here to investigate the explosion, since no one has determined the cause. When hearing this, Mao Mao gets curious and starts looking around. She sees shrapnel all over the building. With this being an attempt of arson, it's easy to see why Li Haku was sent to investigate instead of a low-ranking official. Despite this building being a warehouse, Mao Mao thinks of its weight in terms of being a part of the palace to the emperor. The country of Li is overall pretty peaceful, however, there's always someone with issues. The occasional barbarian attack, famine or drought here and there. Who knows how long peace with neighboring nations will last. There may even be foreign countries who have complaints. Mao Mao then finds the ivory smoking pipe. She's lost in thought, even getting scolded by Li Haku. An explosion, food storage, a pipe. She then runs to a similar storage and gets supplies from Li Haku so she can do an experiment. She makes a box, putting flour in it. She has a flame rope readied, warning Li Haku that standing close is dangerous, but he doesn't listen. She scurries away with the box exploding with flames lingering on Li Haku until they splash water on him. She determines the source of the explosion to be fine buckwheat powder, as it burns easily, and she presents the pipe that likely caused it. If someone had snuck inside the warehouse to take a quick smoke, the outside wind could flow in, blowing the powder into the air, and when lighting, the flower-filled air would catch on fire and explode. So people shouldn't smoke in the warehouse ever again. Mao Mao learned this because she had blown up a room at the Vertigris house once, 
Later that night, Mau Mau realized that she accidentally brought the pipe home with her, but upon speculating, thinks it to be a little too expensive for a warehouseman. Later, Gao Shun brings a report to Mau Mau involving a bureaucrat who was poisoned by eating raw pufferfish. He wants her thoughts on it because 10 years ago, a similar case happened where the chef mentioned not using any pufferfish in his dish. However, in each case, the pufferfish guts were disposed of, where all the poison was contained. So how were each of these men poisoned? She sends Gao Shun to bring her more evidence. Then suddenly, Jin Shi appears, asking what's going on, only to jump scare Mao Mao, who was lost in thought. The next day, Gao Shun brings the cook's notes, which contain everything served to their master. Mao Mao finds nothing unusual in the ingredient list, except for seaweed. She decides to get a look at the kitchen, and later is escorted by Ba Sen, who doesn't seem to have a good impression of her for some reason, and also seems somewhat familiar to Mao Mao. As Mao Mao investigates the kitchen, a man comes screaming at them, asking why they're in his kitchen. Ba Sen calms the man, telling him they're here on official business, and we learn the man is the poisoned bureaucrat's younger brother. Mao Mao finds a peculiar jar that contains some of the master's favorite snacks. And after the brother assures Mao Mao it isn't poisoned, she takes her leave. On the carriage ride back, Ba Sen asks why she backed down so easily, but she didn't. She took some of the jar's contents with her. She finds the seaweed especially strange since it isn't in season yet, but even if salted it and preserved from last year, it wouldn't last this long. It's not native to their region, perhaps imported from the south. Mao Mao then presents two plates of seaweed for Gao Shun, Ba Sen, and Jin Shi to look at. Mao Mao speculates that with a merchant learning this particular seaweed is a favorite of the bureaucrats, to profit from it, he had some locals produce a salted version of it. It's problematic because sometimes poisons can become not poisonous. For example, eels are usually poisonous, but after bleeding them or cooking them out, they become edible. In the case of seaweed, she believes it was soaked in lime water first. What she's brought before them is one batch soaked in lime water and one without. So she eats the soaked one, causing the guys to panic. But it's okay, because she has an emetic. Oh, yes, they're just gonna shove it down her throat and make her vomit. Back at the task at hand, who suggested that the trader bring salted seaweed? If the bureaucrat suggested it be imported, of course it'd be his own fault in a sense. But if he didn't, bringing it from a region that doesn't eat it is obviously taking a big risk. With all that, the culprit turned out to be the bureaucrat's younger brother. Motive? Being the younger son, he wasn't treated well. He wanted his older brother out of the picture. Case closed. How did he learn about the seaweed poisoning? From a guy at a tavern, apparently. In Mao Mao's room, she contemplates all the exciting ways she can use the mushrooms growing on the dead bug she got from Jin Shi. She gets so excited, she bumps into him and gives him a warm welcome home. And upon hearing this, he's so elated, he starts banging his head into the doorway. As Jin Shi relaxes with some tea, he complains about the military man who's been keeping him busy lately. A man who comes from a good family, past 40, not married, adopted his nephew as his son, and has him handle his housework. A famous weirdo whose only interests are Go, Shogi, and Rumors. He constantly files complaints, barges in, and continually extends deadlines on decisions that need to be made. Jin Shi believes this man has it out for him. However, as Mao Mao works, she has a bad hunch about who this man is. Lo Han, the military strategist, appears in Jin Shi's office, bothering him the same way he described. He's somehow connected with the Vertigris house, as he has ties to a courtesan he often played with. He considered buying the particular courtesan, as she had beaten him in Shogi. She would sell her skills, but never herself. In fact, she didn't treat guests as customers at all. Even when pouring tea, she had an arrogant look, as if she was being charitable to a lowly peasant. However, many with a curious taste were head over heels for her, including himself, as the chills he felt down his spine to be irresistible which reminded the guys of Mao Mao. She was too expensive, so Lo Han had used a trick to lower her value. But before finishing his story, he requests Jin Shi to bring his new servant to solve a puzzling will left by one of the palace's metal workers. With Jin Shi curious, he decides to allow Mao Mao to handle the case. Jin Shi details to Mao Mao about the metal worker who was the palace purveyor that had passed recently. He died without passing his techniques to his son. In the man's will, distribution instructions for his memento which included the workshop shack for the eldest son, furniture with excellent workmanship for the second son, and a fish bowl for the youngest son. And one final note, saying they should all have a tea party together like old times. Mao Mao wonders if the term tea party has some kind of hidden meaning. 
However, Jinxi tells her the sons have no idea what that means either. Mao Mao also thinks the mementos seem unbalanced. Why is the last son only get a fish bowl? Is he so unloved? Mao Mao then gets escorted to the address of the metalworker's sons by Ba Sen again. At the house, they're welcomed by one of the sons who shows them around. They are welcomed into the work shack, where the furniture appears oddly placed. As Mao Mao looks around, the eldest son gets impatient, asking if they can really help in figuring out their father's technique. It's just as Mao Mao and Basen have heard, the eldest was left this shack, the middle child this drawer, and the youngest a fishbowl, with the bowl being more valuable than first assumed, since it's actually made out of glass. The second son then mentions his father left him a key, however, it doesn't fit the keyhole he assumed it was for in the drawer, so the actual key he needs is nowhere to be found. He has no idea why his father would leave it for him. The eldest son was annoyed because he inherited the shack, but he can't move the drawer out. With the two sons envying the youngest because at least he got something he could actually sell. Their mother then enters, telling the boys to stop being rude to the guests. With her two sons having grown to be cynical and her youngest unable to express himself, she felt her husband was worried about them until the moment he died. With the tea served, the sons assumed their normal table positions. Mao Mao then noticed how the sunlight from the window should have hit the drawer, but how come the drawer has no sun damage? She looks at the window and then checks on the drawer, wondering if there's something stuck inside the keyhole. Ba Sen checks in on her. Oh, that's why he looks familiar. He looks just like Gao Shun. Mao Mao then starts putting all the pieces of evidence together and something clicks. She has the youngest put his fishbowl where it used to be against the window and fills it with water. When lining up the symbol a certain way, it beams directly into the key lock and begins to burn. The key now fits and inside they find a strange rock, the same kind their father used to collect. It seems the youngest is the only one who truly understood his dead father's intent. He wanted the three of them to work together. However, the older brothers felt they were inadequate compared to the younger, who was very talented at metalwork. With the mystery solved, the three brothers now get along and see Mao Mao and Basen off. Before taking off, however, she tells the youngest to visit an apothecary named Lo Men, her father, at the Vertigris House brothel. If they're ever feeling unwell, they should seek him out. Back in Jinshi's office, Lo Han explains how things turned out quite well for the metalworker's sons. The youngest bloomed to take over the craft work, the eldest handles the bookkeeping, and the second son finds new clients. They're all helping the family from different angles. With the task complete, Jinshi hopes to hear the rest of the story about the Vertigris house courtesans and how to decrease their value. But Lohan finds an excuse not to talk at all and takes his leave. Later, Jinshi meets with Mao Mao, asking if she can do his makeup. Mao Mao certainly thinks Jinshi doesn't need it, thinking there have been many silly wars in history, and several of them caused by beautiful women. If this man in all his heavenly beauty were to put on makeup, she wonders if he's trying to topple a nation or something. Jinshi remarks that her imagination goes too far sometimes. He's actually looking for something to put on his face to disguise himself. That night, Mao Mao preps several things and gets ready to go all out. The next day, she meets with Jinshi, surprising everyone when getting close to his hand. It was really just to tell him his incense smells too expensive. He needs to pick something else. Working at the brothel, they pick customers on appearance but also by scent as well. Those with multiple showy scents tend to be rich but have venereal diseases. Those who smell like livestock don't bathe and are unclean. Most new visitors to the Vertigris house are actually shooed away. Mao Mao then does some techniques to ruin the sheen of Jinshi's hair, and has clothing brought for him that smells a little bad, so it'll take away his expensive incense smell. Having Jinshi undress, she observes his physique. With his usual look being that of a heavenly maiden, she's surprised to see his body to be well balanced and muscular. But it's not good for his disguise. So they put stuff in him to change his overall shape and clothing. And then Mao Mao applies makeup so his face matches his attire better. She then gives him a horrible smelling drink that'll make his lips and throat swell so his voice can change. And then has Jinshi stuff his face with cotton to alter his face's shape. And with that, his transformation is complete. They then dress up Mao Mao as well, and the two ride in a carriage together towards their destination, with Jin Shi under the alias of Jinka. Arriving near their destination, the two wander about the town, with their goal being a restaurant just outside the Pleasure District, where Jin Shi will be meeting an acquaintance, and Ba Sen acting as their secret bodyguard. Along the way, Mao Mao gets Jin Shi some skewers, and the two enjoy them in the little alleyway. They continue their walk, and Jinshi wonders why Mao Mao is in such a hurry, like she wants to split as soon as possible. Which is true, she wants Jinshi to get to his destination, so she can go buy some radishes and chicken. 
He then asks her if life at the palace is so bad. He thinks it is better than life in the pleasure district. She thinks it's fine but often worries about her adoptive father who is left by himself. Which surprised Jinshi hearing she actually cared about someone other than medicine or poison. Jinshi gets intrigued hearing about the details of Mao Mao's father, who is a eunuch. They arrived at the restaurant, where Mao Mao can see the upstairs area is a brothel. She assumes this is the reason Jinshi had to disguise himself. But if it were to see a courtesan, she feels he could have just gone to the pleasure district. He then asks Mao Mao how one could decrease the value of a courtesan, something he originally wanted to know more about from strategist Lo Han. Mao Mao finds the question unpleasant. She breathes a deep sigh, opening with the idea that there are many ways. At the Vertigris house, girls take most of the important lessons while working as servants, and at that time, are separated into those with beautiful appearances and those without. The latter, after debuting, immediately take on customers to sell their bodies. Those with talent, however, are taught tea ceremony and given higher education with which to entertain patrons. Thus, their prices increase. Once high enough, they start to appear only very rarely, and eventually, you reach top-ranking courtesans who cost a year's salary just to have tea with. Some retain their chastity until the day they're bought out. Their value comes from their purity, losing that would easily have their value. In addition, a pregnancy would reduce it to nearly nothing. After answering, as Mao Mao takes her leave, Jinshi grabs her arm, stopping her. He asks if she's going to leave without him, but of course, her going in would ruin the work of his disguise. As she leaves, she thinks it's all fine, because she said what she said without expressing too much emotion. Looking back as Jinshi enters the brothel, she wishes him a good night with a slight sadness. The sounds of a baby crying as a woman brings a blade right down towards it. This was a nightmare Mao Mao awakened from. It was a dream from when she was a baby. After breakfast, she gets a task from her father to deliver something to the Vertigris house and immediately gets attacked with a hug from Pyrin. It seems Pyrin is fighting with the madam over offers she's receiving, but with the two distracted, Mao Mao uses this as an opportunity to escape. She enters the annex to deliver, remembering this woman used to hatefully chase her out, but she must not have the energy any longer. The woman's illness worsens by the day and her memories are in shreds. Mao Mao gives the woman medicine, but knows at this point it won't even provide temporary relief. Even so, giving the woman medicine is the only treatment they could think of. The Vertigris house is now a reputable establishment, but a decade or so ago, it used to operate in shame. This courtesan served customers during that era, and was unlucky enough to contract syphilis as a result. When Mao Mao's father came to visit the Vertigris house, the illness was an incubation. If he'd known about it then, he might have been able to treat her, but nobody trusted a eunuch who suddenly appeared out of nowhere. The courtesan had to serve customers, there was no other way to live. A few years later, when the rashes started to reappear, the sores spread almost instantly. Since then, this woman has been locked up in this annex, out of sight of the customers. Which is quite generous, considering courtesans who can't work are usually thrown in a ditch. Mao Mao gets a warning by one of the servant girls that the weirdo with the monocle is here, so she shouldn't go outside for a while. As long as she stays put, he won't come here. A longtime customer of the Vertigris house, an old acquaintance. Mao Mao then notices the woman laying out rocks as if she's playing Go, thinking she's a stupid woman. Evening comes and Mei Mei enters to let Mao Mao know the weirdo is gone for now. The two head to the bath together, where Mao Mao questions why Mei Mei hasn't left, given she's just under 30, but is at a normal retirement age for a courtesan. However, she wants to keep working here just a little longer. Mao Mao doesn't know what's going through Mei Mei's mind, and it's not a rabbit hole she wants to delve into. If it's what everyone knows as love, that's an emotion she's sure she left behind in the womb of her mother. Back at home, Jinshi is exhausted as he was surprised that the restaurant he was at was also a brothel, which he wanted no part of. He then brings the drink left by Lo Han to Mao Mao to share with Shui Lian. While sitting with her, Shui Lian can tell Mao Mao's mind is wandering. She had hoped working would get her mind off the sickly courtesan, but it didn't. Shui Lian then has Mao Mao pick up some medicine, and she's excited because the outer palace pharmacy is much better than the rear palaces. She wonders what's inside the medicine cabinets, and would love to rummage through the whole place. Sui Ren then comes, asking what Mao Mao's doing. It seems she herself is here to resupply the medicines at the guardhouse. Observing her, Mao Mao wonders why the woman dislikes her. Later, as Mao Mao works, she contemplates on how mysterious Jin Shi is. Not just about his work, but he often takes long baths, 
burns incense before leaving, and eats vegetarian food. It's like a purification ceremony. Are eunuchs allowed to perform ceremonial rites? It's not out of place for a noble to do that. But if he is such a high rank, why is he a eunuch? Was it a decision of the Empress Dowager? In Jin Shi's office, Lo Han enters to continue his discussion with Jin Shi from earlier. It seems Lo Han had been trying to convince the madam to give him Mao Mao for the last decade, and he feels as if Jin Shi stole her from under his nose. He wants to buy her from Jin Shi, but Jin Shi isn't looking to sell. Which gives Lo Han a laugh, as he mentions there aren't many that could defy someone as high up as Jin Shi, meaning he knows Jin Shi's true identity. Lo Han claims he's just concerned about his daughter, which strikes a nerve in Jin Shi. He knows Lo Han is Mao Mao's father by blood. Jin Shi then comes by to Mao Mao later, telling her the weirdo official wants to meet her, the weirdo by the name of Lo Han. The two stand in a minor silence until Mao Mao gives him the dirtiest look, causing Jin Shi to back away. So he assures her he'll find a way to turn Lo Han down as Mao Mao continues her work. He's never seen her like that before, and he never wants to see that again. Mao Mao gets distracted by herbs again until Sui Rei finds her. Sui Rei begins to pick the weeds, which leads Mao Mao to ask what she's planting, only to become surprised hearing Sui Rei is planting something to resurrect someone. If such a thing exists, Mao Mao wants that more than anything, but it was just a joke. As Sui Rei leaves, she tells Mao Mao she'd just be planting some morning glories, with a sort of eerie and weird air about her as she leaves. In Jin Shi's office, Gao Shun tells Jin Shi about the medium ceremony this afternoon. However, Jin Shi can't get Mao Mao's horrid look off of his mind. It left him distraught and distracted. Elsewhere, Bihaku comes to Mao Mao telling her there's trouble. The same day that one warehouse had blown up, thieves had broken into a different one. What was stolen were some ceremonial tools, and no one knows the value of them either, as even the man with the most current knowledge on that warehouse had gotten sick from seaweed poisoning, the case Mao Mao solved more recently. The previous manager passed away last year. He had a sweet tooth. Oh, it was Master Conan. It's strange that two people connected to this warehouse died in incidents framed as accidents. Were the deaths in pursuit of some goal? Li Haku then pulls out the expensive pipe he had gotten from Mao Mao. He tried to give it back to its owner, but they declined. The owner had apparently received it from some court lady, but why would they randomly give it to some warehouse guard? Apparently, the guard escorted the court lady outside the castle because she was walking alone in the dark, and she had given him the pipe as a token of gratitude. Mao Mao deduces that giving someone such an expensive item might compel them to use it right away, starting a fire to divert the guard's attention and break into another warehouse. This compels Mao Mao to ask about the court lady, but apparently she was wearing a scarf that hid her face. But she was described to be a tall woman that smelled like medicine. This made Mao Mao suspect Sui Rei, but she needed more evidence first. Mao Mao tries to convey that several coincidences could point to someone being the center of it all which makes Li Haku praise her for her intellect. However, Jin Shi had been watching them and feeling a little lonely. Seeing the High Lord, Li Haku decided to flee. In Jin Shi's office, after hearing the details, Mao Mao still explains she has no suspects, but feels like several traps were set in the hopes that some of them would work out. Jin Shi is surprised Mao Mao isn't excited or curious about this case, like she usually would be. So he tells her about an interesting item in stock from a local trader. Ox Bezor, which makes Mao Mao light up just thinking of the medicinal gallstone only found in one in a thousand cows, which makes her so excited she's practically panting on his desk, and she agrees to work hard with the Ox Bezor as her prize. During her investigation, Mao Mao finds out the officer who got food poisoning was from the Board of Rights. He and Master Conan were both related to ceremonies. If the incident with the pipe was the steel ceremonial tools, then these events disguised as coincidences, must line up to form an intentional incident somewhere. There must be a ceremony that's important somewhere, medium or higher. Mao Mao needed to find out where these ceremonies took place. She gets a scroll with an image of a ceremonial building that's west of the outer court, called the Altar of the Sapphire Sky. The worker in the library then details how he used to work in that building, and was worried it would fall apart back in the day, as the pillar hanging from the ceiling seemed a little too big and it could fall at any moment. It is quite concerning, because if the metal parts fixing the pillar in place broke and the pillar fell, the person directly underneath performing the ceremony would be at the highest risk. If something important went missing from this building, surely they have someone make a new one. 
This thought then flashes the metal worker's sons in her mind. With their father having died recently, there wasn't anyone who could replace what was stolen. She dips out of the palace record room upon hearing the next ceremony is today. She makes it to the building, being stopped by a guard. She knows being a servant, she has no authority to enter, but if something happens, it'll be too late. She then baits the guard, accusing him of being part of the conspiracy involving the ceremonial hall theft, causing the guard to get furious and smack her. The pain is throbbing and she's on the verge of losing consciousness. She gets up with blood dripping. She can't give up now though. She reasons with the guard, knowing there must be someone of noble birth in the hall right now. If something were to happen to them, these guards would all lose their heads. The guard still isn't budging until Lo Han enters the scene. He scolds them for hurting the young servant girl, making the guard begin to visibly pant. Mao Mao doesn't even want to see the person behind her, but there's no time. She makes a dash inside, and as the pillar comes crashing down, she saves the noble giving the ceremony in the nick of time. She's gotta stitch her leg up though. What? It's Jin Shi. I mean, I kinda knew that. Jin Shi is confused at what's going on. He stares at her with a deep concern, wondering what happened to her face. As she passes out, Jin Shi shakes her, pleading with her to wake up. He then carries her out of the hall, past her father, with a bloody trail following behind them. Mao Mao awakens, patched up in Jin Shi's room. Shui Lian comes to greet her, telling Mao Mao not to push herself too much, as she has 15 stitches. In the living room with Gao Shun bottling pillar, the death of Master Conan, the fire at the warehouse that led to the theft of the ceremonial tools, and the manager of said tools falling ill due to food poisoning at the same time. The metal worker that passed could no longer replace the stolen part, and the connection of these incidents to Sui Rei. Later, Mao Mao learned she was right about Sui Rei being connected to these incidents from Lihaku, but was astonished to hear they had found her corpse. As when the officers came to her room, she had already more surprising though is that there are no co-conspirators, with Lihaku calling this a closed case. However, Mao Mao becomes fixated on this. Sui Rei couldn't have possibly caused all these events by herself. Was she even the type of person to commit a self-end? Was she behaving apathetically and unemotionally because she knew she had no future? Then it came to Mao Mao, resurrection medicine. She ran out of her room, barely able to contain her excitement. She'd like to speak to the doctor who examined the corpse. In the morgue, Mao Mao is greeted by the doctor she knew would be there, the one that seemed close to Sui Rei. Mao Mao suspects that the poison Sui Rei drank was made by thorn apple, planted by Sui Rei, which looked like morning glories. The plant is poisonous, but in the right amounts, it can work as an anesthetic. It was exact Mao Mao pissed the doctor off. Jin Shi asks what about Sui Rei's corpse? And Mao Mao explains she most likely walked out on her own and wasn't dead. So that's Jin Shi. From that day, he decided to wear this mask, drinking this medicine every day to suppress his manhood. When Gao Shun mentions this medicine will one day make Jin Shi impotent, Jin Shi spits it out, saying the same will happen to him. But Gao Shun is fine since his children are now adults, and he even has grandchildren, just like Jin Shi. Jin Shi plays it off, saying, Jin Shi, the eunuch, is 24. The next day, they meet with concubine Lo Lan, who the emperor apparently doesn't find makeup often, but this confuses the emperor some she is. Lo Lan's father is an important high-ranking official, who was the previous empress dowager's favorite, so they need to be careful around her. In terms of lacking appeal, concubine Li Shu is similar. The current emperor despises his predecessor's taste for younger girls. He doesn't intend to lay a finger on Li Shu the Empress Dowager who gave birth to another child some ten odd years later. At that time, the doctor spent all his time tending to the Empress Dowager, so the birth took place without an issue. However, A Duo, who gave birth at the same time received no attention, resulting in the loss of her uterus. The current Emperor's firstborn child was soon lost after, if he had survived. No, Jin Shi just felt he needed to have a new prince, tasting for poisons. Seeing the Emperor with Ling Li gave Mao Mao a better impression of him as not just some lewd middle-aged guy. At the Vertigris house, Li Haku is distraught to hear rumors that one of the three princesses is being bought out. Mao Mao heads to work at the Jade Pavilion, but is summoned by Li Haku, who wants to know the cost to buy out a courtesan. Mao Mao opens his question with the two candidates who would be eager to buy Pai Rin. The first, an old master of a merchant family who had come to the Vertigris house even when they were struggling. And the second, a high-ranking official in his early 30s who's apparently very compatible with her in bed. However, a point of concern is how tired he looks the next day. 
The Haku is unsure on what Mau Mau means by this, so she elaborates. Anytime Pyrin feels unsatisfied in bed, she'll try to seduce anybody and everybody. She's a nymphomaniac. But even so, she really helped raise Mau Mau, so she also has a strong maternal side. Mau Mau thinks of Lihaku being in love with Pyrin while fully understanding what her job is. He's an incompetent dog, but also an earnest man, a lovable idiot who's working to climb the ranks for a woman, and he seems to have the stamina to last with Pyrin. He's not a bad candidate to buy her out. After telling Lihaku Pyrin's upfront cost of 10,000 silvers, he gets depressed knowing the price is 10 years of his salary but he could still manage. She then tells him to take off his clothes so she can figure out if Lihaku has the kind of body Pyrin would like. And man, he's certainly ripped. Mau Mau observes him in different poses, believing this could actually work, except she needs him to remove his last article of clothing. But suddenly, Jinshi barges in, not looking too happy. Upon learning she was called for help and was closely studying Lihaku's physique, Jinshi certainly doesn't get any happier. Mau Mau can apparently tell a person's lifestyle by simply looking at someone's physique. Oftentimes, clients don't divulge their lives much to an apothecary, so it's a skill she learned over the years. Jinshi asks if she could figure him out by looking at his body, which surprises Mau Mau because she can tell he's jealous of Lihaku. But not the way she was thinking, as Jinshi is surprised to hear he's not the body type for Big Sister Pyrin. In his room, Lihaku trains his body to deal with his troubles buying Pyrin. He gets a knock on the door and somehow ends up face to face with Jin Shi. Jin Shi found out about him looking to buy Pyrin and offers him a loan of 20,000 silver. Lihaku thinks it's strange for Jin Shi, a stranger, to offer him help, but it's because Mao Mao trusts him and Jin Shi looked into his background. He's the son of a regional official and squad leader. Lihaku finds the offer tempting. But he feels he doesn't need that much, maybe only even a quarter of that. He declines Jinshi's offer because Pyrin is a woman he's serious about. How can he call himself a man if he can't buy her out with his own silk? Hearing this, Jinshi smiles and takes his leave. Throwing the offer out of the window, Lihaku is unsure about what to do for money. Maybe he can show off at the next training session or ask for more work. He doesn't know when he'll see her, but he doesn't want to just buy her out without telling her. He wants to know how she feels. Receiving a message from Pyrin herself, Mau Mau learns that Lihaku doesn't need all that money he's hoping to raise, as long as she loves him. But the confusion with a courtesan being purchased is probably coming from the fact that Lo Han was looking to buy someone. A new spring began, and Lady Gyokuyo's pregnancy became a certainty. Little Ling Li loved to play with her mother's tummy. She then brings some paper over to Mau Mau so they can draw together, and when Mau Mau draws her a poisonous mushroom, Hong Yen gives Mau Mau a scolding smack. In Jinshi's office, Lohan discusses a blue rose, as he's looking to have Jinshi arrange them somewhere in the palace. With roses being out of season, Jinshi comes to Mau Mau for help, to have the roses done for next month's garden party, only to get upset when even she mentions roses won't bloom for another two months. After learning the request is from a certain military weirdo, Mau Mau takes on the job regardless because she doesn't want to run away from him forever. She'd love to crack that smirking monocle of his. Day after day, Mau Mau works with Xiao Lan in the steam bathhouse she had built in the Crystal Pavilion to make an artificial garden house for the roses to bloom. Mau Mau was exhausted, not seeing any success, working herself to exhaustion, until one day, Xiao Lan shows her a budding flower. The day of the garden party comes, with the debut of the new pure consort, Lo Lan, who's taking Gyo Kyuyo's seat this year due to her being pregnant and needing to keep it a secret. Jin Shi walks forward, handing a vase filled with a variety of colors, including the blue roses Lo Han had requested. With many onlookers staring at him with jealous eyes, he finds most concerning are the people he can't read, like Lo Lan's father, Shisho, who won the Empress's affection and even more troublesome, the military strategist Lo Han. Mao Mao wakes up after resting on Ying Hua. Jin Shi comes over to ask how Mao Mao achieved the creation of the blue roses. She explains they were all originally white, and she had dyed them using colored water. But with the final stage set, she was ready to kill. Han wins, Mao Mao will become his daughter. But if Mao Mao wins, he must buy a courtesan out from the Verdigris house. She won't say who though. Two more rules though. Mao Mao presents some liquid that with three mouthfuls would become a strong poison. 
She pours the liquid into 3 out of 5 cups. After each match, the winner chooses a cup for the loser to drink. And the second rule, if someone forfeits, they lose. With the first loss, Mau Mau must drink. A second loss, and she drinks again. The third match is like a Mau Mau's won, so Lohan is going to buy a courtesan from the Verdigris house. Lohan spent his whole life only thinking of everyone a courtesan from the Verdigris house named Feng Xin. So confident in his abilities, he began laughing because she completely dodged kept going up in a bidding war amongst her fans. Though Lohan had climbed the ranks as a military man, his stepbrothers had taken his right to inherit the family title. He could never dream of reaching her price. One day, however, they played a game of Go where the loser would give the winner anything they desired. While playing, their hands eventually held each other and they spent the night together. Later, due to some family issues, Lohan was he knew a courtesan who lost all value drowning in his failure. Lohan woke up in the vertigo came happy learning that Mau Mau had made it. Looking at the gift he received from Mau Mau, Lohan couldn't help but think he wanted to be with the daughter of Feng Xin left for him. He hated his daughter, but still wanted her near him, and is displeased that man put his hand on his daughter three times during his Go match. The madam then brings Lohan to take his pick for courtesan purchase. However, no matter how beautifully they dress, all of them look like Go stones to him. He comes toward Mei Mei because she's always been good to him. However, she walks towards the door and hearing a song from a familiar woman, Lohan runs towards the song despite the madam not wanting him near her. He now understood the message Mao Mao was trying to tell him with the flower she sent. There's a flower for him that has retained its beauty, despite the fact that it withered. And inside the annex, he finds Feng Xin singing a song while looking at the moon, and it brings him to shed a tear. The madam follows, telling him to get out and pick from the other courtesans. But no matter what, he wants this woman. He'll pay whatever the madam wants, a hundred thousand, two hundred, or whatever. Oh man, I really teared up a little watching this. Lohan puts the ghost stones in Feng Xin's hand, and seeing her beautiful face, he tells her, let's play go. Weeping in joy at the sight of the smiling beautiful woman, just as he remembered. Seeing this brings Mei Mei to tears as well, wishing Feng Shen had been honest about her feelings from the start. Lo Han will buy this woman who's beautiful as a balsam flower. Back in the palace, Ba Sen scoffs remarking that troublesome father and daughter duo, referring to concubine Lo Lan and her father who had pushed hard to get his daughter in the rear palace. Mao Mao gets served a meal for all her hard work, but before she can eat it, Jin Shi comments on how he thought Mao Mao hated the weirdo strategist. She replies she doesn't hate him. After all, she exists because of him. Knowing her mother, she wouldn't have gotten pregnant if she didn't want to. There's drugs to prevent or abort pregnancies, so ending it would have been easy early on. She recalls her mother must have lost her mind when things hadn't worked out so much that she was willing to hurt herself. She brings up the fact that Lohan never visits Jin Shi outside of his office. It's because Lohan can't recognize human faces. Jin Shi is unsure of what she means until she explains her father can tell the shapes of eyes and mouths, but he's unable to view the parts together as a whole. She learned this from her adopted father, but for some reason, he's able to discern Mao Mao's and Lo Men's faces. She definitely dislikes her father, but doesn't hate him. She's just grateful she was able to become Lo Men's daughter, but respects her biological father's intellect as he was able to help her save Jin Shi. He doesn't make the decisions the same way Mao Mao does using evidence, but instead his gut feeling. Mao Mao is only annoyed because if her father had taken action based on that feeling, she might have had her hands on the resurrection drug right now. Later, Mao Mao learns of the details from Mei Mei on who Lo Han had bought. Mei Mei still plans on doing courtesan work for a bit longer, but when she does get bought up, she'd love for Mao Mao to dance with this shawl. At night on the castle walls, Mao Mao practices her graceful dance among the stars. Surprised to see Jin Shi had been watching, this startles her, causing her to trip and nearly fall off the wall, only for Jin Shi to barely catch her. She wonders what he's doing here, but he got a report that another weird woman was climbing the outer wall. He pats her on the head, telling her not to cause any more trouble. He then has her explain herself. In the pleasure district, when sending off a courtesan who's been bought out, it's customary for the other courtesans to dance. Jin Shi is surprised she knows how to dance. However, she was taught dancing as a part of the bare minimum of education. Jin Shi then details how he heard Lo Han had bought out a courtesan and how he'll be on vacation for at least 10 days. At the Vertigris house, they're apparently having a banquet for a whole seven days and nights. Oh. 
It looks like Mao Mao's wounds have opened up again. <laughs> She'll definitely need some restitching. But Jinxi isn't going to let her do that here. He grabs her and jumps down the wall and puts her in a princess carry. I'm sure she wasn't expecting that. As they go together, Mao Mao has something important to say to him. Something she's been meaning to say for a while. She grabs his face, getting close, and tells him she'd like that ox bazaar now. Getting upset, Jinxi headbutts her. And the two continue together under the stars. Aw, oh, that was amazing. And luckily, Season 2 was announced, so we are definitely getting more. Subscribe to the channel as I'll cover it when it releases. For now though, watch this next video. It's me, Comfy T. I'll see you all in the next one.